The topic is robotics and difficult measurements in difficult environments. Let me give you a little bit of context for what that means. I came into the field of robotics specifically to address the field of sensors in two contexts. One is sensors for robotics. The other is robotics for sensing. Sensors for robotics means giving the robots the kind of senses that humans have, smell, vision, hearing, taste, touch, and what we call proprioception, awareness of our own body parts, plus some additional sensors that uh, we don't have but we uh, achieve by means of uh, equipment that we build, so sensing of magnetic fields, electric fields, other kinds of things uh, where we augment our senses with technology. Our robots need those for the same kinds of reasons that we need those. So that's the sensing for robotics part. Another important reason to couple robotics and sensing is that we want to use robots to make measurements, to go make observations and report, report them back to us in places where we can't go conveniently. That's what I call robotics for sensing, or uh, sensing difficult measurements in difficult environments. For example, when we need to do planetary exploration or expo exploration of the moon, it's uh, very expensive, very dangerous to send people. Only a few people have been to the moon. But we have lots of information about the moon, lots of information about Mars that we have achieved by sending robots equipped with sensors, measurement instruments to give us data of various sorts that uh, solve our quest for knowledge about those places. Uh, for example, on Mars, there's a big question about whether life has existed, whether life could exist. So we equip robots that go to Mars with sensors that uh, can detect chemical signs of life, either the ability to support life or the previous existence of life. In exploring the moon, we're interested in the nature of the rocks there, whether there are minerals that it might be worth the enormous expense of bringing, bringing back because they're very uh, rare on Earth. There are also uh, terrestrial applications that are very important, places where we want to find information where it's too dangerous or too expensive to send people. So uh, one of the early uh, projects during um, my first years in robotics in the early 1980s was uh, we had an incident at Three Mile Island in which a nuclear reactor went out of control. Uh, it became necessary to uh, find out by going inside it the nature and extent of the damage. And part of that exploration was done by a robot built by one of my colleagues to go in, um, take pictures, send back video, and also gather samples, uh, make, make radiation measurements inside, bring back samples for uh, analysis outside um, in the case of disasters, both natural disasters uh, and unnatural disasters like uh, the 9-11 uh, uh, destruction of the uh, World Trade Center buildings in New York, uh, much of the uh, rubbles there were explored by remotely controlled robots looking in particular for people who might have survived and been trapped in the rubble. What, what are the main problems in this field? What research remains to be done? We continually are refining our scientific instruments to make them more and more automatic. If you look back at the history of analytical instruments, measuring instruments, initially they required a great deal of skill on the part of an operator, knowledge of the instrument, 
And as this technology evolves, we build microprocessors, small computers, into the instruments so that more and more they become plug and play. This evolution helps our ability to deploy these instruments remotely, that is to, to mount them on robots, mobile robots, and uh, bring them to places where they make the necessary adjustments themselves because uh, no, no instrument is a universal instrument. It always has to be adapted to the particular measurement that's being made. In the past, those adjustments were done by the person making the measurement. Now, as we automate these instruments, as we build more and more intelligence, artificial intelligence into them, they become better adapted to adapting to the uh, unexpected circumstances that they need to be able to respond to to give us the information that we need. This is an ongoing quest. There are also uh, ongoing issues about being able to observe more and more things as they become of interest. For example, I recently had a discussion with one of the students in our institute who is interested in characterizing the soil mechanically um, over which a planetary uh, explorer might be moving. Presently, this is done by looking ahead with a camera and trying to characterize, will this soil support the vehicle or will it not be able to support the vehicle? Will the vehicle sink into sandy material and the wheels get stuck. So he had an idea for a new instrument which involves heating the ground in front of the vehicle with a laser and observing how the heat diffuses and uh, is dissipated uh, conductively and radiatively. And this will be different depending on whether the um, material is porous or solid and that will aid the visual data in determining um, whether that soil can support the vehicle or whether there's a region where the vehicle has to go around it rather than over it because it doesn't have sufficient strength. These kinds of problems continually come up in situations where we want to go into new environments and we need to be able to adapt our machines and our instruments to those environments, adaptation to the unexpected. I can give you a couple of examples of difficult measurements in difficult environments that I've been involved in in the past. Uh, one of them involves inspection of airplanes. Maybe you remember that in the late 1980s, an airplane uh, uh, belonging to Aloha Airlines in Hawaii that uh, got a lot of flying hours and many takeoffs and landings, uh, suffered from fatigue due to the pressurization and depressurization cycles uh, that caused the uh, fuselage, the top of the airplane, to come off in flight. Uh, miraculously, the pilots were able to land it. A few people were hurt, uh, one person was killed. Uh, but it was regarded as a miracle that this plane survived. The analysis of the damage led to the conclusion that airplanes needed to be inspected for cracks and corrosion in better ways than had been done in the past. And I spent uh, several years productively working on building robots for inspecting aircraft for cracks and corrosion. We used a variety of measurement techniques for that. Some of it visual with special lighting, controlled lighting, um, and some of it involving electrical measurements called eddy current sensing. Uh, and the environment is uh, difficult because working on an airplane is difficult. It can be high off the ground. It's a, co uh, a, a curved surface. The uh, people who do it generally have to wear harnesses and ropes that uh, protect them from falling. 
So this is the kind of environment in which we would like to uh, get people out of danger, gather the information, gather the data, and then allow it to be analyzed both in real time and record it for uh, later careful analysis. A second example from a very different domain, what we call medical robotics, the kinds of contributions that we can make to uh, medical diagnosis, medical visualization. We do a lot of work in that area. One project that uh, comes to mind uh, involved the uh, diagnosis of pressure ulcers, what used to be called bed sores. People who are confined to bed or confined to a wheelchair and don't move around very much uh, suffer from the stagnation of the blood. The blood ceases to circulate effectively. And then the uh, tissue decays. This causes serious problems. In light-skinned people, it's not too much of a problem because early diagnosis is possible. The uh, phenomenon results in a reddening of the skin, which uh, the physicians and nurses who provide care can easily see and catch early before it gets very difficult to treat. On the other hand, with dark-skinned people, it's a serious problem because the damage that is externally visible is not visible until the uh, degeneration of the tissue has progressed to the point where it becomes very difficult and very ex expensive to remedy it. Uh, it's been estimated frequently that uh, this kind of damage, when it gets to a, a late stage, can cost as much as $100,000 to treat uh, one bed sore, one pressure ulcer like this. Um, I worked with a student who herself was a, a dark-skinned person um, to develop an instrument that used an optical technique to uh, penetrate the pigmented layer in the skin and observe the ratio of oxygenated to unoxygenated blood cells, which was a measure of the stagnation of the blood. And uh, the student has now graduated, finished her PhD, and has in fact started a company to commercialize this instrument. 